And first up, I'm, I'm pleased that we have Vishal Shah, who is really the world-renowned um, expert on the cost competitiveness of solar, and also a former applied materials um, colleague. And uh, earlier this year, Vish released a report uh, through Deutsche Bank called Crossing the Chasm that basically indicated that solar will be at grid parity in 80% of the world by 2017. Thanks, Lene. Good morning, everyone. I'm excited to be here today to talk to you guys about um, my experience so far in the solar sector. Like Lene, I started my career at Applied Materials uh, in the 90s, and I was with the, uh, with the company uh, in, uh, until the early 2000s, and then I moved over to Wall Street to uh, look at some of these uh, emerging interesting growth companies. And my experience with solar has been also around the same time, 2005, six time frame, when we started taking a lot of companies public, uh, mostly in the manufacturing space. And I was at that time at uh, Lehman Brothers, and um, we did the IPO of Sun Power, which was spun out of Sun uh, Cyprus. Uh, we actively were very actively working with Applied Materials and their efforts in the solar program and a number of other private companies that went public around the same time frame, particularly from China. And um, you know, I've seen a significant change in the sector. You know, clearly a lot of the focus at that time was in Europe. Um, many countries started coming up with subsidy programs: Germany, Italy, Spain. And then you had the, the financial crisis, which dragged the sector into oversupply, which clearly dro drove prices down significantly. And, and where we are today is it's thanks to the manufacturing uh, efforts uh, of the industry, along with, of course, the, the industry dynamics, the competitive dynamics, that we've seen prices go down from almost $4.50 at the peak uh, of, uh, of this is the solar panel price to as low as $0.50 cents a watt today. And uh, because of that, we think we are nearing grid parity in a number of regions. So what I'll do is I'll go through a few slides, and then by, at, at the end of the presentation, I'm happy to answer any questions. So first, uh, our view is that solar is competitive today. Despite the more than 30% CAGR over the next 20 years, over the past 20 years, the industry is still only about 1% of the nearly 6,000 gigawatt uh, worldwide electricity market. And we expect if you look at the, the global electricity market, we think that over the next 20 years, it's going to double to about $4 trillion. And uh, the solar sector, we think, is going to increase by a factor of 10 during the same time frame, uh, which we think is going to generate about $5 trillion of cumulative revenue for the industry. And, um, and these are all big numbers, but it really is an important I mean, the reason I'm bringing some of these numbers is, is because it's, it's significantly uh, important not only to uh, one particular government or country, but global, uh, I think a lot of global countries are, globally a lot of you know, governments are looking at the sector as a source of uh, growth as well as uh, you know, job creation. We think that by year 2050, global solar penetration rates could increase to about 30%, and with faster growth in many of the developing countries. Example is uh, one of the examples that I really wanted to highlight is India, which recently announced targets to reach 100 gigawatts of solar capacity by 2022. And as of last year, uh, India had less than three gigawatts of solar. So clearly, there's a lot of momentum building, not only in the US, but globally. And that's going to be a good thing for grid parity because it's going to bring the cost down um, of a lot of other components in the supply chain. So. In 2000, in year 2000, just to give you some numbers again, I'm sorry about the, 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 the busy slide with not a lot of numbers, but just to give you perspective around how, where the sector has come from, in year 2000, solar was installed on roughly about 100,000 homes and facilities. And over the last 15 years through 2015, solar has been installed on roughly about 6 million homes and facilities. Nearly about 200 gigawatts of solar has been installed so far but yet it's only about 1% of electricity generation. We think that over the next 20 years, um, nearly 100 million customers, new customers would deploy solar, and as I said, about $4, million, $4 trillion of value would be created during this time frame. And um, you know, over the next 20 years, we think about, uh, the about 10% of electricity, global electricity production will be from solar. So the bottom line here is that the industry is going through a fundamental change. And the opportunity for companies as well as a lot of government uh, governments is significant. 
this slide shows the what, what the capacity additions have looked like over the last few years, and you can see that from a, and this is global capacity additions, and you can see in this slide nearly about 30 percent of global capacity additions have been either wind or solar, and that speaks you know, significantly to the volume uh, or the penetration of, of this technology over the last couple of years. We think that growth is going to accelerate you know, beyond 2019. So a few key trends that I want to highlight. First, as I said, the, the global financial crisis was actually a, a blessing for, in, in a lot of ways because it brought the cost down significantly. You know, we saw prices go from 450 to 50 to 60 cents a watt. On top of that, you saw some innovative financing models by companies like Solar City and NRG, which acted as a second catalyst for further reduction in financing cost. Um, the adoption of solar was, was much more difficult at that time because you had upfront capital investments you know, to buy electricity for the next 20 years, and, and that business model is changing significantly with some of these residential leasing companies. You know, over the next five years, we expect the, the industry to experience the final piece of cost reduction, which is the customer acquisition cost for distributed generation. If you look at the most recently reported results by companies like SolarCity, the customer acquisition cost is, is more than the actual solar panel cost. It costs about 65 cents per watt for SolarCity to acquire a customer. And the solar panel prices that they pay with some of the... Um, the tariffs today are about 65 cents. So clearly there's a significant room for um, cost improvement at the customer acquisition level. And on top of that, we see a significant opportunity in energy storage over the next five years, which we think is going to enable even greater adoption of solar. This is a, a busy slide, but on this slide, I wanted to just show you a few of the countries that may already be at grid parity today. And, and this slide, what it shows is the cost of, levelized cost of electricity of solar today versus in, you know, what we think is going to be in 2017 and 19, <clears throat> and what the price of electricity is uh, in each of these markets. So again, just a snapshot, but a lot more countries are at grid parity in our view. <clears throat> This slide shows you know, how solar compares to other sources of electricity generation. And again, it's a, it's a, it's a, the data is mostly for the US electricity market, but I think this, this chart can be replicated for a lot of other countries globally. And you can see that so, utility scale solar cost can be as low as four cents to you know, seven cents per kilowatt hour. And uh, residential solar prices can also be, uh, it, they vary uh, depending on you know, where you are putting solar, but it could be seven, as low as seven cents per kilowatt hour. <clears throat> you can see this, what's interesting about this slide is that solar is almost as competitive as wind, which was not the case five years ago. And a few more examples of grid parity um, globally, you know, Mexico, Philippines, Italy, all these places, we are starting to see adoption of, of solar at a more competitive level. I already pointed out to um, another example in India. So again, this slide, well, it's again our, our, our view of which of these markets are at grid parity today. And you can see a lot of these, a lot of, this, uh, a lot of the markets with high electricity prices, for example, in Australia, residential market is at grid parity. You know, you see Chile, for example. I was just recently in Chile looking at a lot of solar projects there. Significant uh, improvement there over the last five years. You, you're seeing companies selling merchant power plant, uh, projects in Chile. So, you, you know, wherever there's a, where there's the solar radiation potential is significant, I think you see uh, those markets at grid parity today. Now, this slide shows the evolution of costs um, as we see them, and this is an average um, of all the companies that you know, we track and, and have reported results. So um, you know, there may be some change, there, there may be some variations. But if you look at the slide, the, um, the cost today, and this is residential solar installed cost, is about $2.66 a watt. We think that cost comes down to $1.77. And, and a lot of the costs, I mean, the big portion, as I said, you know, 47 cents is the, is the average. Uh, Solar City's last reported number was 67, 65 cents. 
So there's significant potential for that number to come down. Um, you know, you can see that there's other balance of system cost reduction potential also. The industry is working on a lot of these things, especially as the scale becomes uh, more important. I think, you know, you're going to see uh, costs come down further. With battery, we think there's another potential uh, for cost improvement. If you look at uh, the, the cost of storage today, it's very expensive, but as battery costs come down, you know, we think to less than $300 per kilowatt hour. In this example, I have used a $150 number. You know, we think that the LCOE of solar with battery would be less than 20 cents, and that, that in our view would enable a lot of markets where electricity prices are above 20 cents to go, go and adopt solar in a much more meaningful way. So we think this is, um, this, this chart just shows, you know, at some point in 2018, 19 timeframe, you can see that crossover in, in a lot of countries uh, globally, you know, where, where solar could be economic with batteries. So the big question that we get, levelized cost of electricity, sorry about that. And, so the big question we get is, is whether solar can still grow in a low pri oil price era. And I just wanted to show a few slides where we, we, you know, we think solar can still grow despite oil being below $50. And by the way, just to provide some context around oil, our in-house, and I'm not an oil expert, but our in-house energy forecast or oil forecast calls for oil prices to go re to rebound gradually to you know, above $50, maybe around $55 to $60 over the next 12, 18 months. So with that said, you know, most countries generate less than 5% of electricity from oil. And, um, and solar, in many, many of the major solar markets like the US, China, oil is even a smaller percentage of electricity generation. So first of all, Oil impacts the broader energy complex, but not as much the electricity generation in our view. And um, even if you consider the impact of um, oil on electricity prices, oil generation plants turn on when very, demand is very high. So the incremental cost or the variable cost of oil-based uh, oil electricity generation is actually uh, quite significant. You can see that uh, the marginal cost of electricity generated from oil is well above the retail price of electricity in most states. And um, so if you look at the, uh, the, the price, you know, it's, uh, it's anywhere between 10 to 50 cents per kilowatt, uh, per kilowatt hour in the US uh, Northeast region. And then uh, this example, we just wanted to show you what, what the sensitivity of, uh, of different oil prices would be uh, to the uh, cost of electricity generation. And you can see the cost can vary, and this is, a, again, this is not the marginal cost, it's the base cost. You can vary from $0.06 cents to $0.23, cents depending on where the oil prices are. So clearly, uh, you're going to see, if let's say oil is between $50 and $60, you're going to see oil-based electricity generation between you know, around $0.09 to $0.10 cents per kilowatt hour, and, and solar PPAs are being signed for a lot, a lot less than that today. So I would not worry so much about the impact of oil on solar. As you can see over here, the price of uh, electricity has gone up even as, uh, as the, re the retail price of electricity has gone up by almost 600% since 1970, while the price of oil has shown significant volatility during that same time frame. <clears throat> An example of, um, you know, this is a snapshot of all the countries uh, and percentage of oil electricity uh, generation from each of these countries. So again, it's a, it's a wide mix, but the countries that have significant electricity generation from oil are not that big in solar. Uh, so what, what we really think matters to the industry because from, from a volume standpoint is, is China, US, uh, India, some of the other European countries, Australia, et cetera. And then the other last point that I wanted to make on oil is, is that you know, almost about 40% of the average US consumer bill is transmission and distribution spending. And transmission and distribution spending has been going up. So in 2010, for example, TND CapEx, or the transmission and distribution CapEx, of about $27 billion was about three times more than that of 1981. So you've seen a uh, you know, consistent increase in transmission and distribution spending. And I look at a few of those companies as well, and, and that trend is only you know, going up. 
<clears throat> so what does all of this mean in terms of um, supp su supply and demand for the solar sector? This is a busy slide, but it just shows uh, uh, our view of where the capacity is coming from. And this, this capacity is mostly at the raw material level, which is the polysilicon uh, used to make solar, solar panels. Uh, and we think that in the, in the very short term, I mean, you can see that Polysilicon capacity grew significantly from 2010 to 2012 timeframe. This was a time when all the poly plants started or came online. And then the growth has been very gradual. And in 2015, you really did not see that kind of growth. I mean, you're going to see flattish you know, poly market in 2015 and 16 timeframe. And then maybe a small increase in 2016. Meanwhile, <clears throat> demand for, polysil uh, for polysilicon has been growing quite significantly. You can see it's gone from 30 gigawatt market or in 2011 to you know, almost 45, and, and we think it's going to be almost 60 gigawatts next year, uh, 65 gigawatts next year. So, so there's a significant growth. That the market has doubled while the poly, poly demand, or poly supply hasn't really gone up so much. So we, we saw polysilicon prices go from $300 to all the way down to $15, and, and they have since re rebounded you know, to between $15 and $20 right now. <clears throat> this is a snapshot of demand by each of the countries. I won't go through all of this in detail, but the bottom line here is if you look at just a, a high level, you can see China, Asia is becoming a much bigger player in the, in, the, in the mix. You know, Asia in 2011 was only about 3.5 gigawatt of the, to this is total demand. So it went up, you know, to about 26% of the mix. And over the last two years, we've seen Asia become more than 50% of the global demand. U.S. is again, again a become, uh, becoming a bigger portion of the mix. I mean, America's overall, we've seen uh, demand becoming almost 30% of the total mix. Meanwhile, the European demand has gone down. You know, Europe used to be 60% of the mix before 2010 uh, time frame, and it's now only about, it's less than 15% less than right now. So what you're seeing is, is um, this demand obviously is shifting away from Europe to Asia and, and, and the U.S. And that brings me to the last point that I wanted to make here, which is uh, this, uh, the new financial tools that, that we've seen in the marketplace um, over the last two years, which is the, the companies, the finance companies that you know, raise capital in the public equity markets and use that low-cost capital to invest in solar projects. And these are called uh, yield codes. You know, the yield codes were very successful over the last, I would say maybe the, the NRG was the first company to launch a yield co, where they went out of the IPO, went, went out of the public market, raised capital at three to four percent cost of capital, and then deployed that that capital into projects, and, and was a significant improvement in the total cost of capital. Um, until six months ago, when oil started going down and a lot of the other stocks went down. The cost of capital has gone up, but we think it's a temporary phenomenon. We think you know, the markets, once they stabilize, these yield codes are going to be a significant enabler of uh, solar adoption, in our view, going forward. So what are these yield codes, and why are they such a big deal for renewables? First, uh, renew yield codes enable companies to access low cost of capital uh, by spinning some of these operating assets into a separate entity, and this allows them to lower the cost of capital. Um, the financing cost, if you look at the solar levelized cost of electricity of, say, five to seven cents of, uh, per kilowatt hour, financing represents about 30 to 40 percent of the total cost of that seven cents. And so if you bring the cost down, uh, you know, that's a big, big enabler uh, to bring the total solar cost down. And in, this is even more important in emerging markets where interest, interest rates could be very high. It could be as high as 13 percent in places like India. So... If you can get about 500 to 800 basis points of lower cost, financing cost, that I think is going to you know, reduce the uh, this levelized cost of solar electricity by another 20, 30 percent in our view. I don't want to go through this uh, in detail, but what, uh, what the question that I think I, you know, in investors and a lot of industry participants have is, you know, what, this is all great in a, in a low interest rate environment, which we are in today, but what happens when interest rates go up? And, and our view is that even in a rising interest rate environment, you know, this financing tool is going to be much more efficient, and it's not going to necessarily have a negative impact on the broader solar sector because of the growth potential that we see in solar. 
you know, solar has been growing as we've seen in the past, you know, at more than 40% run rate over the last few years. And even if you see a 100 basis point increase in interest rates, uh, that just means that, you know, the growth rate has to go up by 6% in order to keep the cost same. And, and I think the industry can execute on that. And then the final question that I'm sure a lot of us have, have is, is what happens when the ITC steps down in the U.S. from 30% to 10%? Um, we think that the, the yield co-business model actually is probably the best suited for such a, such a change in ITC. Um, first of all, we don't even know if the ITC is going to step down. There are some discussions going on as we speak uh, to extend the ITC beyond 2016. But if there was a change in ITC, you know, this is probably the best business model that, that can weather the storm. And I have some examples in, in this, which I don't, I don't think I want to go through in the interest of time, but it shows you why we think the impact of ITC reduction is, is not necessarily going to be that significant. So then the final question is, you know, what happens here in Texas? Um, clearly, solar is becoming a lot more competitive here in Texas, and there are some examples that I've highlighted. I don't have to go through all of this with you because I'm sure you're familiar with this, but utilities are starting to you know, show more interest in the state because solar is becoming more competitive. Just recently, two days ago, Southern Company announced that they were buying a 51% controlling interest in a, in a large utility-scale solar project. And, um, and you know, I think there's a, there's a lot of momentum being built um, in the Texas market, which uh, is shown by companies like Austin Energy and First Solar, as well as Sun Edison. But the growth potential I think can be um, even more significant because I think if you look at it from a um, larger in, in investor standpoint, you know Texas has a lot of potential. It has it is a 24 billion dollar annual electricity generation market, uh, which is you know among the highest in the U.S. and com almost comparable to any other large European country like Spain or UK. Um, it's the 11th largest electricity market in the world, and um, it's also one of the you know, among the highest uh, CO2 emitters. So you can see that there is a lot of potential for Texas to play a ma major role in, in, in renewables, particularly in solar, um, with, with things like net metering or, you know, solar-specific RPS in, in place. I think you're going to see a lot of momentum uh, in, 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 a, in a low electricity price environment. So with that, we stop here. And um, if you have questions now or maybe later.